And thank you also for helping us stick with the schedule. Um, I did request uh, that you, you, know, you, you do that, and thank you. We have time for one question, which I'm going to take from among the ones that have come up. Um, and the question is, can Singaporean entrepreneurs survive with only angel investments and not government grants? Slightly provocative, but might be interesting. My, my, view, my view is that there is, for the angel investment round in Singapore, it is actually not a problem. And if the company is successful and grows to the stage where it can be backed by venture capital institutions and where it requires 10 to $15 million, I also do not think that that is a problem. The real problem is the gap between what I would call the angel round and the institutional VC round where the business may require three to five million. And that is the gap that is missing. Because many of the institutional VCs, if they raise 400 or 500 million dollars, cannot do three to five million dollar deals. So that is the most crucial gap, in my opinion, in Singapore. More discussion on Singapore now, as we invite a panel of speakers to talk about the emerging entrepreneurial boom on the island. And I'm going to uh, invite the panelists to come up on stage as I read out their names. Our panelists today are Dr. Frank H. Levinson, Managing Director of Small World Group. Frank is co-founder of and serves as a venture partner at Phoenix Venture Partners. He has a 28-year track record of starting and building advanced materials-enabled companies in the IT sector. Mr. Jayesh Parikh, Managing Partner, Jungle Ventures. Jayesh is one of the founders of Sony Entertainment Television, a major television network launched in collaboration with Sony Japan. He is also a board member of Shimaru Entertainment and One Animation. He is an active angel investor with investments in various VC funds in the Silicon Valley and startup enterprises across technology and media spaces. Thank you. Mr. Meng Weng Wong, who describes himself as the founding instigator of Joyful Frog Digital Incubator. Meng Weng Wong is a Singaporean entrepreneur who has founded several companies. In 94, he founded Pobox.com, an email services company. In 2003, he led the group that designed the Sender Policy Framework Standard, which was later embraced and extended by Microsoft. And in 2005, he founded Karmasphere, a reputation services venture. And I know exactly why you're wearing the frog around your neck. <laughs> JFDI. Thank you for being here. And the chair for the discussion is Mr. Ravi Manta, President, Thai Singapore Chapter. Ravi is an angel investor and chairman of the Indus, uh, of the Indus Entrepreneur. Sorry. Thai, Singapore. From 2001 through 2011, he was a portfolio manager at Fidelity Investments in Boston and London, where he co-managed the $35 billion Select Global and Emerging Markets Fund. Welcome. My name is Ravi Mantha, and uh, this is a joint session uh, between IM Pact and uh, TIE Singapore. So uh, welcome to all of you, and welcome to Singapore. Can I have a quick show of hands on um, which, uh, how many of you are actually Thai charter members or members back in your home countries? This is a, this is a terrific group. So uh, we've, got, we've got two charter members on the stage and we've got a smattering uh, in, uh, on, on the floor. So it's, 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 a, it, it's absolutely wonderful to see the partnership between IAM Pact and uh, TIE. Um, so we have three amazing local entrepreneur investor angels on the stage today and we're looking forward to a very exciting uh, discussion. Um, first, I'd like to invite uh, all three of them uh, to take five minutes or so uh, to, to just describe what they're doing and their connection to, to, to the island in particular, uh, starting with Jayesh. Uh, so. so every product or service is a symbol of bravery. Whether you think of a plane, a car, whether you think of electricity, telephone, personal computer, you think of internet, Google, Facebook, iPhone, 
or a television channel, or Tutor Vista, or Nokri.com. Every one of this product or service is a symbol of bravery. Because what it takes is courage and faith to build on an idea. So many of us have ideas, but either we never do anything about it, or after the product or service launches, then you say, aha, I had thought about that idea. But it's only till you have the courage and faith to build an idea. And those people who actually do have the faith and courage have a risk-taking gene. So if you're a professional looking to become an entrepreneur, the first thing you should look for is, do you have the risk-taking gene to become an entrepreneur, number one. Number two is, once you do start an early-stage startup, then do you have the risk-taking ability to expand that into a mega business? Donald Trump says that you need four characteristics to become a successful, ent successful entrepreneur, and that is attitude, actions, persistence, and passion. One such story that I want to just uh, relate to you is the story of uh, Sony Entertainment Television. So uh, my friend Sam, who is here in the audience, Sam, just put your hand up here. There you go. Sam, uh, who was teaching in the United States, came to India to pitch, uh, invited by the Advertising Club of India. And as he was sitting in Taj flipping channels, he suddenly got an idea, said, wouldn't it be great if we had a general entertainment television channel, uh, which is cable and satellite channel? And that was the idea, and that's where it all started. The Indian partners, including Shemaru and Jackie Shroff, and some of our uh, Singaporean partners here, Sam is one of them. Uh, however, Sam is not an IIM graduate. I am an IIM Calcutta dropout. And fortunately, you have one, though. Rakesh, can you put up your hand, please? And Rakesh Agarwal, he is an IIM Ahmedabad alumni. So we were going to start a, a television channel called Ace TV just on our own, and then we came across Columbia and TriStar Pictures, and we've long story that culminated in a joint venture, and Columbia TriStar subsequently became uh, Sony Pictures Entertainment. Uh, we also did a, discovery, uh, dis a joint venture for distribution with Discovery. Uh, it was called Set Discovery, now it's called MSM Discovery. The name of SET changed to MSM. We started with a one general entertainment channel called SET, and then followed by Max, which is a, a movie channel. Sub, we acquired, which is a comedy channel. Uh, Pix, which is an English movie channel. Mix, which is a music channel. Six, which is a cricket channel. And Art is the first uh, inroad into a regional channel. It's a Bengali channel. We have over 300 million uh, viewers in 70 countries. And uh, we also launched uh, good uh, programs, marquee programs like Indian Idol. Uh, we also have the IPL. So the IPL cricket, uh, I'm sure the IIM folks are very happy. Uh, on the first day, on, you know, IIM Calcutta folks are happy because Kolkata Knight Riders won the first match. Yesterday, Bangalore won the match. So IIM Bangalore guys are happy. And Ahmedabad doesn't have a team, so IIM Ahmedabad guys are always happy. <laughs> uh, a month ago, we exited from this business uh, to Sony. So this is the end of a long, incredibly terrific journey uh, that culminated in a fairly good exit. Uh, I want to welcome all of uh, the overseas guests. How many of you are from overseas? OK, fair, uh, welcome, welcome to Singapore. Uh, this is what uh, Singapore looked like in uh, 2009. And uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, Singapore keeps uh, reinventing itself as far as the tourist attraction is concerned. And uh, I'll just make a few comments about the Singapore entrepreneurial ecosystem. It's supported by uh, the government. There is uh, two organizations called National Research Foundation and Spring. They've invested over $100 million in early stage startup. Uh, the industry, of course, the ventures with the VCs and the angels. And then there are organizations like BANSI, which is Business Angel Network Southeast Asia, which is the equivalent of IAN, which is Indian Angel Network, and Mumbai Angel. It's a similar uh, organization here. TAI, Ravi is the president of TAI. NUS is National University of Singapore, so they have an enterprise cell. Uh, INSEAD is a, the, uh, the other uh, MBA school for the world. And HUB, HUB is a uh, incubator, uh, collaborative workspace for social entrepreneurs. And, and Singapore has just uh, got its first uh, hub in Asia. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, super angels, Ko Bunwi, uh, Joey Ito, who is the CEO of MIT Media Lab. You got uh, people like uh, Dave McClure, who is uh, part of the PayPal Mafia. 
you got uh, Toivo, who's the first founding engineer of Skype. Eduardo Saverin is a co-founder of uh, Facebook. He's a local uh, super angel. Professor Pocam of the US and Professor Turner. So we have a good local uh, super angel community that invests alongside. And then VCs, of course, take over after that. Uh, we also had a few uh, follow-on exits. We had exits at uh, Hulu, uh, follow-on funding of $24 million. Hulu is, uh, Wiki is the equivalent of Hulu here in uh, Singapore. Hungry Go Wear got sold to Singtel. Rebonds uh, got a funding of $20 million. Uh, Tencube got bought by uh, McAfee. Ixigo got bought by uh, Make My Trip. Job Centers got bought by, so fairly decent. Property Guru got funding of uh, $60 million. Uh, you know, the last thing I want to mention is uh, just about the Hub. The hub Singapore, as I mentioned, is a social collaborative workspace uh, for social entrepreneurs. There are 40 hubs all, all over the world, and the first successful hub in, is in uh, Singapore, and its first successful uh, hub in Asia is in Singapore, and there are 338 hubbers uh, today. Uh, if, if any of you caught the straight stands today, there's a one-page article on the Hub and the founder, Grace Sai. Uh, this is what the hub looks like. The social entrepreneurs are, of course, looking for double bottom line. They are looking for financial return as well as for social impact returns. And this is the next generation of uh, entrepreneurship, which is mainstreaming purpose-driven businesses. And uh, I invite you to come join the bandwagon and become impact investors along with it. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Meng. Is it OK if I just? sit here. I'm, I'm pretty chill, so I don't think I'll, I'll stand. So this is Smoochie, the frog. <laughs> Smoochie likes to come along to these things. So let, let me tell you guys why I'm really excited about what I'm doing. And this, this touches directly on the subject of entrepreneurship in Asia. So I went to school in the US. And I did one company there that was bootstrapped. I did another company there. It was venture funded. And then for my third company, I chose to come back to Singapore. I chose to come back to Asia because I think there is going to be a golden age of entrepreneurship in Asia. And Singapore is, I think, a good example of, of how that's happening, as we've just heard. I think the reason there is a golden age for entrepreneurship in Asia today is because, finally, Asia has caught up to the West. We, you know, we've had everything that the West has to offer. We've absorbed it and we've implemented it. You know, the last 30 years in Singapore were the age of the MNC, right? foreign companies coming to Singapore and setting up shop and hiring Singaporeans. And now Singaporeans know how to run business. So we've caught up. And when you're caught up, you are now ready to do the next thing. You're ready to innovate. You're ready to explore the frontier. And, and that's one huge trend that's happening, not just in Singapore, but all around Asia. And so I think that is one trend. Another trend that brought me here is the idea that innovation, you know, for a long time we've thought innovation is this sort of magical thing and, and we just try, we try really hard and we throw our best people at it and some of them fail and some of them succeed and we must celebrate the whole thing. But we're beginning to learn from people like Josh Lerner, who, Kumin, who you mentioned, there are people studying entrepreneurship, there are people studying innovation and these people have studied it and now they're beginning to teach it it is possible to learn to do innovation. And when you have that kind of education under your belt, your failure rate goes way down. You know, it's not 18% it's not success anymore. It's not 25% success. It goes all the way up to 80%. And we can structure this. We can systematize it. I'll give you an example of, of one entrepreneur who enjoyed that 80% success rate because he had a mentor, right? His name was Steve Jobs. We may think of Steve Jobs as the sort of archetypal, anti-hero, vigorous entrepreneur who just came out of nowhere and succeeded out of nothing. But actually, Steve Jobs had a mentor. When he was in his 20s, Steve Jobs ran across this guy called Robert Noyce. Does anybody here know who Robert Noyce is? Right, one of the traitors eight, founder of Fairchild. And Robert Noyce decided to take Steve Jobs under his wing and say, I am going to teach you everything that I know about business and everything that I know about technology. And you know, from the guy who basically invented the transistor and commercialized the microchip, you know, this, is, this is pretty good mentoring. So Steve Jobs had his mentoring. And we are now beginning to have a generation of mentors who give back by mentoring the younger generation of entrepreneurs who don't have to go all the way through the school of hard knocks 
And that is, you know, the people on stage with me today are all incredibly generous mentors who are giving back to the next generation. In fact, two of them are investors in my little incubator, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so, uh, so people are teaching entrepreneurship, people are teaching innovation, and we are learning that it's possible for entrepreneurs to learn the theory and then practice the theory in a way that reduces the risk and reduces the chance of failure so that they end up succeeding. And so that's, that's another very exciting thing. You know, we can teach. And, and if you zoom out, right, if you think about the internet, so my field is internet, mobile, web. If you zoom out, the internet is a medium. Movies are a medium. Music is a medium. And what do you see? You see the pattern that movies have the, the movie industry has film school and then movie studios. You know, this is a fairly mature industry. It's well organized, it's specialized. You have film school, and then the actors and directors move on and they work for the movie studios, and then you get hits, right? And the same thing is true in the music industry. You've got music school, and then you've got music studios and record labels. Now, on the internet, I think we are reaching the point where specialization is beginning to produce schools and studios as well. So, what are the internet studios of today? Those are the accelerators, the seed accelerators that produce new companies, the way that music studios produce bands. And up until now, internet entrepreneurship has been incredibly risky and incredibly difficult because it's a little bit like expecting a group of actors. You say, all right, here's a bunch of actors. Okay, guys, I want you to write me a screenplay. And then once you've written the screenplay, I want you to go and shoot the movie. You have to do the cinematography and the direction. And if you went to a bunch of actors with that proposition, they would say, no, no, man, I, I, you know, I tried writing a screenplay once, and it, I'm, just give me the script, and I'll be your actor. But I can't be the guy. I can't be the domain expert. I don't have the idea. In Hollywood, those roles are all split up. You've got actors, directors, producers, screenwriters. There's a whole system. And up until today, you know, we've been sort of expecting the archetypal Silicon Valley entrepreneur to be this kid who is a programmer, he's 23 years old, and somehow he produces Facebook, right? But in reality, there are not that many Mark Zuckerbergs, there are not that many Clint Eastwoods, there are not that many Quentin Tarantinos. As the internet matures, we will have studios that put the talent together and create a package and fund it, and we will have schools that teach how to do lean startup and customer discovery and agile development. And so I think these three trends, right, the fact that Asia is growing up and we're caught up, the fact that innovation is becoming systematized, and the fact that we're beginning to see a school and studio system evolve, I think these three trends make it very, very exciting to do what I am doing today, which is I'm running one of these studios. Um, we we're in the business of helping very young entrepreneurs succeed and produce a real business. So that's what we do at the Joyful Frog. We've done 20 companies to date, and we're hoping to do another 200 companies over the next few years. So if you hear of a major success story coming out of Southeast Asia in the next five years or so, chances are pretty strong that it will have come through, if not my studio, then somebody else's. All right? Thank you, Meng. Uh Frank? So I, I confess, as I, uh, I got here today, I, I was pretty nervous. I, uh, I grew up in Indiana, not India, and I didn't leave the U.S. until I was 50 years old. So you all are so well-traveled. Um, then the first, then the, one of the first speakers said, uh, and of course we all have MBAs, and, and I have a PhD in astronomy. So I, 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 I was already very nervous to get up here and talk in front of you. <laughs> but, uh, but then the speaker started talking, and, and, and I realized we had common experience. Um, they said, you know, we started a company, and, and, and it failed. And my first company, after working at Bell Labs for three or four years, I started a fiber optic company, and I was summarily fired within the first year. And, and it was for the wrong reasons, but, but I should have been fired is the real answer. Um, I was a terrible CEO. The next time I started a company, a few years later, it was the same company, a uh, different name. Um, we didn't have any VCs, so there was no one to fire me. But I, but I also had a better CEO. 
And, and, and from that came a company called Finisar, because I worked at a few big companies and never finished anything, and I wanted to finish a few things. And today that company is uh, the largest fiber optic component and subsystem maker in the world. So I got to have the IPO on the NASDAQ and so on. Well, let, me, let me tell you a few things about the world as I've seen it, because I'm now here running an incubator like these other two fellows. The first thing is that entrepreneurship is really on the rise throughout the world. And, and as evidence for this, I've judged business plan competitions for Startup Korea and Startup Chile. I've judged them for Intel and for Amazon, and I've judged them for Stanford and Cambridge. So it's, it's all over. Every, every country is trying to get involved. Every government is trying to get involved because social transformation is happening so fast that the old ways of doing it simply won't work. So, and, and, and this, this idea of having startups, of, of putting the, this, you know, your young people, your, your people that want to take risks through this sieve is, is really catching on. One of the things, though, that I think we need to be careful about is, <clears throat> and this is a joke from the U.S., so it may not translate well, but I suspect it does, is there's sort of three great lies in this world, and you can look them up on the web. Um, the first one is the checks in the mail. We all have had that experience. But the second one is, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> so, and, and so, so they've done a number of programs. In the, in the U.S., we have our national science foundation and they give out grants and they have our SBIR programs and they give out things and these are typically panels run by professors and government people that think they know where the world's going and they try to give out money. It turns out that some of the very best programs though now they realized in, in Israel uh, about in the mid 90s they started a, a plan where they where they gave the money essentially in partnership with VCs and they didn't give them any fees so the only reward the venture capitalist had is if he had exits. So there was perfect alignment. And that program is running, in this, and, and those of us on this stage are a part of it now here in Singapore. Israel had no VC community in, in the mid-90s. Today it's the start of nation, right? So the way the program works in, in, in Singapore is if we find a company we want to start, a group of people, some IP, if we put up 90,000 Sing, the Singapore government puts up 500,000. And that sounds like a good deal, but that's not why we're involved. We're involved because for three to five years, we'll get a call option on the government money, and we can take them out at our discretion. So if we start 20 companies and 10 are bad, the government eats 85% of the losses. But on the 10 good ones, we buy them back. And it allows us to take a lot of risk, because in a country that is still learning how to, how to, how to grow startups, the way Silicon Valley has, has now already done, it helps us take that risk. But we have no exit. If we have no exit, then there's no reward. In fact, really, if, if there's no exits for all of us, the Singapore government had a jobs program, and we put up 15% of the money. OK, so that's the, that's the next one, is, is be careful. If you're, if you're influencing government things in, in Indian places like that, try to get them to work with the VC community, because they will put down discipline. What you don't want to do is start a company with some friends, have some super high valuation that cannot be sustained in the next round then even the angels feel screwed. So it's a, and you don't want to have things where, the, where there's not good paper documentation and so on. Um, okay. The next thing today is, and, and it's a reality around the world because it's in papers in the U.S. And, and everywhere, is that there's a large number of seed fundings way beyond what can be sustained at the Series A, Series B level. And I, for a while I thought, well, we just need to get the ecosystem in balance. But I've now begun to wonder if that isn't this whole ecosystem adapting and saying, let's just have more seeds and more failures. And let's make the sieve and the, and the Darwinian process of creating good startups very brutal to these first round guys. So I think if you look around, you'll see that you know, Y Combinator and many of these places, they, you, know, you hear about their famous ones like Dropbox, but you don't hear about all the failures. And there's lots and lots of them. Finally, I'm going to tell you one story that's a, that maybe helps a little bit. I think that one of the things that we tend to do in Asia, and I tend to try to discourage, is, is to not copy. In, in the Chinese culture, there's a practice called, I think, and I'll mispronounce it, Shenzai, which means they honor the pirate, the copier, to take something and make it just incrementally better. But the real startups that are successful have to have something that, that makes them uniquely so. Kobun, we talked about Razor, and Razor is a company that that makes you know, remarkably agile 
additions to the gaming experience and, and, and makes it better. And they sell on that basis. It's, it's, a, it's a clearly distinguished product. So, and, and the place to look for those ideas is not to go to the U.S. and, and to go to, to Europe and say, well, what can we copy from there and do, do incrementally better? It's to find your own. So let me give you one that I think is unique here in Singapore. I've been giving it away as an example. The, uh, Singapore is, the is a country that has one of the highest densities of people of all countries in the world. It's a little island, as you know, 15 by 20 miles, and, and, and five and a half million people now. Please bring it to Small World Group, and uh, please bring your questions now. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, I have to tell you a story about Frank. When we asked him to be on the panel, He's a very modest man. He said, you know, well, why me? You know, there's so many other people who can, uh, who can be on the panel. And we said, you know, among other things, well, you know, you were on the Forbes rich list in 1999, to which his reply was, yeah, back then I had more money than brains and time has corrected the imbalance. <laughs> I didn't get smart. <laughs> so uh, I think we should uh, explore this um, uh, the points that you raised a little bit, Frank, which is the role of government. Uh, and, you know, I've been on the island for about uh, less than two years now, and what is extraordinary, uh, just looking at the ecosystem, is uh, the amount of support that entrepreneurs get. Not only local entrepreneurs, but people who are willing to you know, move over here from, from the region or from the rest of the world. But what should be the role of government? You know, the, and, and how do uh, the three of you who are doing angel investing uh, and, and incubation see? How should that evolve? You know, what is your best uh, uh, approach in terms of what, what do you think the government should be doing and is not doing, or how can they adjust their approach? I, I think they have to, I think what Singapore is doing is, is in some sense very right, and that the, the amount of failures you'll have early in an ecosystem like this is higher than normal. So without the government involved, I don't think you'd have the system thriving at all like it's trying to now. So I think it has to get involved, but if it gets involved in a way that that, that creates more unbalance, and I think it's difficult. They, they had programs just like the U.S. where money was given to, to professors and, and, you know, to roll out an idea further. It hasn't been that successful, in my opinion. It, 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 it's, it's okay, but, but, and they gave some to VCs where they matched it, and the VCs could fee it. But in some of those cases, they didn't invest very often. So they, the fees they pulled out were quite substantial compared to the amount that they invested in some cases. But in the scheme that they've got now, and which some of us are involved in here, there's no reward for us if we don't create a successful company that's profitable, that has an exit either through acquisition or through, through IPO. Mm -hmm. And so we're perfectly aligned with trying to really create that ecosystem at this point. So I think to, to, to think about how you're using government money to align with what really are the government goals is, is a challenge. Okay. Jay? So as an angel investor, what I'm looking for is a good entrepreneur with a good creative idea. And here, the risk-taking ability has sort of reduced, is, is not reduced, but is, is very low. And so one of the things the government can do is that if you really want to uh, promote entrepreneurship, then you have to promote risk-taking ability. So folks are f sort of fat and happy, and there is no hunger. And so there is no risk-taking ability relative to many of the other countries. That's one part of it. The other part is the, in a good creative idea, is to have an education system which makes, allows you to think out of the box. And therefore, that's the other piece that I would say is, let's f make uh, the education system such that people actually have the ability, they start taking risk, and they also have the ability to think outside the box creatively. There's a... A really good um, blog entry and a YouTube video by Steve Blank called A Secret History of Silicon Valley that talks about the degree of government involvement in Silicon Valley in the 50s and the 60s, which nobody remembers today, right? But, um, but back then, the government did actually put, the US government put a lot of money into growing Silicon Valley. And it did it not just through push, which is writing grants and funding schemes and paying for researchers, but it also did it through pull which is we need to buy radar systems, we need to buy control computing systems, we need to buy defense technologies and networks. And the US government went to buy all these things and they couldn't find any big companies to sell it to them. And so they went to Silicon Valley and they bought it from startups. And economic policy is like, you know, it's like string, you can, you can push on it, but it doesn't work very well, you have to pull. And the US government pulled 
Silicon Valley into existence just by buying chips at a time when the only people who could make chips were small companies. And so I think that's something that we are not seeing today. You know, my challenge to the Singapore government would be if you really want to stimulate entrepreneurship and investment and startups and all that stuff, you should go out there and announce a tender to buy something innovative and advanced that the big companies can't do in this country because it's so innovative and so advanced, only a small company can do it. That's a very good uh, point, Ming. I think one of the themes uh, the last couple of years is, you know, big companies can't really innovate and, they're, uh, you know, and so that can benefit startups. Uh, so it's essentially a, a form of outsourced innovation. So we have a question from the audience, which I think segues into it. You know, what are the areas, in your opinion, that are ripe for entrepreneurship in Singapore? Food. Food? <laughs> F&B? <laughs> People might say that, oh, Singapore doesn't innovate, but you look at the restaurants, right? And every year there are a bajillion new restaurants doing really interesting things with food. Bread talk, right? That's a really interesting example. What one we like is, is clean tech, and, and the reason is that we, it's, it's, our thesis is that clean tech is different wherever it's implemented. For example, clearly Phoenix and, and Singapore share something that they, they have a lot of need for air conditioning as cities. But in Singapore, 40% of the air conditioning bill is due for for dehumidification in Phoenix. It's just to make it cooler. It's already dry. So clean tech, wherever it's implemented, is very local. It, it not only is local depending on climate and things like that, but it can be local depending on customs. It can be local depending on regulations. It can be local depending on, on geography. So there's, there's many things. And so there's room for clean tech, unlike a processor, which is the same in Russia and Silicon Valley and South Africa and doesn't matter. Clean tech is different every place it's manifested, and I think that's a, that's an, a really interesting place as well, to, and that's why we invest in it here. And, and my heart goes out to social entrepreneurship. Uh, I think it's very ripe in Singapore. There, are, there is a hub, and there are so many other organizations like INSEAD, which has social entrepreneurship centers. And um, again, it can be a for-profit enterprise with social impact, and that combination is, is terrific. That's a new ripe space. Yeah, the, the interesting story I have about Jayesh is, uh, you know, he's hard as nails as an investor, you know, one of the toughest people I know. And, you know, so if I'm doing a deal and he's sitting on the board, I know that someone's going to look after the money. So, uh, but when it comes to social entrepreneurship, he's got a completely, it comes from a completely different side of, uh, side of his brain, I think, because he just, his, his heart is, you know, completely in that social board. And it's so wonderful to see someone who combines both regular traditional angel investing, but also things that are making a difference to people uh, at, the, at the base of the pyramid. So thank you for that, Jayesh. Uh, I just want to uh, take another question from the audience. I mean, this is very specific to uh, uh, all three of you because you're all kind of working with, uh, uh, you know, directly with startups. Uh, two of you are running incubators. Uh, and the question is, how do incubators aid in prototyping businesses by creating low-risk simulations in the real world? Uh, and, and Meng and uh, Frank could probably answer that. So, uh, Paul Graham is probably the most famous person working in incubation today. He's the founder of Y Combinator and he lives in Silicon Valley. And he likes to say, make something people want. Make something people want. And, uh, of course, what he really means is make something new, some new thing that people want, because we're in the innovation business. But the problem with making some new thing is that it's new, so how do you know people want it? And that is what early stage, seed stage risk is all about. It's all about, does the market want it? And up until very, very recently, the way you would start a company was you would have an idea, and the, the, the quality of that idea sort of depends on how much domain expertise you have, but you would have an idea, and then you would spend two years building the product. And then, with tremendous fanfare, you would launch the product. And then, the customers would say, okay, that's, that's a really nice product. Um, let me tell you that it, it reminds me of something that I actually want. And then you would say, oh, so you don't want to buy this. And the customer would say, no, I don't want to buy this, but I want to buy that. Why don't you go build that and come back to me? So then another two years would go by, and then finally the customer would buy it. And today there's this thing called lean startup methodology. And the whole idea is let's skip the first two years. Let's write the brochure. Let's talk to the customers and say, here it is. Would you buy it? And then the customer says, yes, I want to buy it now. And then you say, OK, well, just give me a few months. Let me get back to you. 
So that has been the biggest innovation in innovation that we've seen. And that is powering a whole new wave of accelerators around the world. In specific, our implementation of that is when we start a company in our program, we want to know who are the first customers. And if they say IBM, we tell them, no, 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 it's either John Smith and you have his cell phone or it's no customer at all. We, our target is that you're to finish the minimum viable product, so proto product 1.0, and you're to sell it to somebody, you know, two or three customers at least, and it has to be at a good gross margin. You can't build the product for $100 and sell it for $90. You've got to build it for $100 and sell it for $200. So our goal is on the, on the money that we give them, they've got to get those three tasks done, complete the product, sell it to some customers at a good gross margin. And then what we believe is we've, we've got a case for, for doing growth funding as a follow-on because we've proven that it, some people will pay and what the price they'll pay, and we're starting to get real customer feedback. So I agree, it's, it's, it's that simultaneous development of the customer and the product that, that really is key for, for today. You know, one of the things I'm always struck by is I think Singapore now is per capita the world's richest country. Well, maybe Qatar, you know, with their oil reserves is a, is a different, uh, different story. But when you're looking at a, a country that's already number one, it's tough being number one in that, you know, it, it, it's just harder and harder to add that growth to maintain the position. So if you're sitting in the region and you're looking where to start your business, right, you know, why, would you, why would you want to come here? What, what, are, what are the advantages? Um, you know, and uh, Meng can start with that because he's got uh, two out of his companies are, are, are out of India, and five out of eight startups in the, in the current accelerator are from the region. So what, what do they see here? So something like a quarter to half of successful startups are actually founded by immigrants. And it's really always been immigrants who are responsible for entrepreneurship. I mean, I think of the four people on this panel, I'm the only one born in this country. So, so there you have it, right? And in Singapore, with what, five, six million people, it is too small a population to really be a market. So we have to think of Singapore as being the sort of regional hub for Southeast Asia. And one of the things that Singapore does right is it, it welcomes immigrants to some degree, not as much as it, it maybe could, but it welcomes immigrants at the level of school. People go to school here, and then they stay, and then they start business here with the advantage of knowing what the home market wants. You know, it's actually quite hard to sell to the Singapore market because the Singapore market is oversupplied in so many ways. Whereas back home in Indonesia or Thailand or Vietnam, things are, you know, the markets are bigger and there's more demand for stuff. So that's my opinion. I think one of the other things that attracts people here is money, as always, and, and there are low-hanging fruits here. One of the in TIS tech incubator scheme that Frank mentioned, uh, the National Research Foundation matches five is to one whatever the incubator fund. So one is that low-hanging fruit. Of course, for that physically, the, the company has to be located in Singapore. The other reason is, of course, the market, the Pan-Asia market. So if you're sitting in an emerging country and you want to actually sell to Pan-Asia, then Singapore is a terrific place from which to uh, launch your product and services. I think one more thing that's important to realize about venture capital and starting companies is you need stability, political and economic stability. And so what you, you know, it's, it's not a fast game, it's, it's a slow game. Instagram is the exception, not the rule. So you need a place where the banking laws are gonna stay the same, where the, where the tax laws, where everything's gonna stay the same long enough so that you understand the bet you're placing today has four or five years to come true. Mm -hmm. And Singapore is that if you compare it to its neighbors. That's why it's the banking hub as well. A popular question from the audience, is Singapore the next Silicon Valley? You know, to, to Two of you have worked in Silicon Valley, uh, or have you as well, so, but maybe you, can, you guys can take the, uh, what are your thoughts so, are on that? I think it's a bad question. And, and the reason is, is I mean, it, it's a temptation, you know, there's temptation to ask questions every time you're asked, you know, answer. Like, when did you stop beating your wife? And the answer is, how do you answer that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I never started. <laughs> despite the fact that I'm divorced. Okay, no. <laughs> but, but the question is, 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 it, is it the next Silicon Valley means, is it the same? And the answer is no, it won't be the same. It'll be unique with, its, with, with the culture that's here and the, the, the people that are here and so on. And so I think, you know, can it be an entrepreneurial culture here? Yes, but will it be exactly like Silicon Valley? Why? Yeah. I think, why not make it unique? Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, uh, we're reaching the end of our time slot. Uh, maybe just one last question. Um, what are the challenges that entrepreneurs face in Singapore? That's also from the audience. 
Well, I think one of the most uh, fundamental for at least an early stage tech and new media startup is uh, people. Uh, to find good technical uh, resources in Singapore is becoming incredibly difficult now. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> very well. So, so. Thank you very much. Thank you to our guests. And uh, I'll hand the stage back to Vinita. Thank you. The golden age of entrepreneurship and innovation in Asia. Certainly an idea whose time has come from listening to the gentleman on this podium. Thank you so much for that. We're now going to take some time for a networking cocktail outside in the foyer, but before I invite you to join us there, I do want to remind you that we have another session coming up after this, which is again going to be very, very interesting. This one's going to be on leaders' perspective, so we've heard from the entrepreneurs. Now we listen to um, another perspective on um, success. We want to reconvene in this uh, ballroom at 5.30 p.m. Uh, because we want all our guests seated and ready by 5.45. So I am going to request you to come back on time. Thank you very much for having been a very engaged audience this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.